Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about how to become a relationship coach. My guest Anne's husband said he wanted a divorce, and he meant it, because five months later, they were legally, officially divorced. The main reason being that their marriage was failing, but also because he started a relationship with another woman once he said he wanted the divorce. But Anne didn't give up on her marriage, and they ended up reconciling in the same month that their divorce was finalized and remarried three months to the day later. They even started a family. Now she says their relationship is amazing, fun, and loving. She's going to describe what she did so you can have the same results. And then I'll be giving out the worst relationship advice of the week award, which is truly terrible and somewhat familiar. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about how to become a relationship coach. We've been getting a lot of questions about that. So I'm going to pull the curtain back and reveal the process and even tell you what the next step is. Maybe your marriage is painful right now and you have a hunch that training to become a coach would put it right again. That is a great reason to become a relationship coach. Lots of our coaches started out the same way. Training to become a coach is where you get the most personal coaching and support and transform your marriage at the highest level while you're learning to become a coach. Or maybe your marriage is doing better than it has in a long time and you just want to keep it that way. Well, that's a great reason to become a relationship coach. Or maybe you're like me and you just want to stay in the fascinating conversation with women like you who make marriage their priority. That's a great reason to become a relationship coach. Here are the three steps. Step one, first, have a transformation in your own marriage. I want to dispel a common myth about becoming a relationship coach, which is that your marriage has to be perfect first. Lucky for me, that's not the case at all because no marriage is perfect, not even mine. And just the other day, I apologize to my husband for being disrespectful for trying to meddle in a conversation with the neighbors about the construction at our house. That's because I tried to meddle in his conversation. So clearly, I am not a perfect wife. So making your marriage perfect is not one of the steps. When I apologize to my husband, I'm happy to report that he thanked me and it cleared up the tension immediately. I have some uh, emotional safety in the bank, which is not something I can say about my marriage from the bad old days. So even though I was clearly off my paper in control land, no intimacy was lost at my house. What makes me qualified to be a coach is that my marriage is transformed from what it used to be. And it's not just me. All the coaches have that indispensable credential. That's step number one for becoming an effective relationship coach. And sometimes it that transformation happens while you're training to become a coach. Maybe you don't have it before you decide to become a coach, but then you get it as part of your training. Step number two, honor your desires. The big thing that I see about the women who become coaches is that they honored their desire. What does that look like? Well, you might feel uncomfortable or guilty or just indulgent about wanting to become a coach. That's pretty common, actually. And the question is, the million dollar question is, will you hold that desire at arm's length and say, well, this isn't the right time, or first the kids need braces and soccer, or I already invested so much in the career I have, or will you just let your desire have its day in the sun by acknowledging it, by writing it down, by saying it out loud? Will you entertain that desire by imagining yourself helping hurting women, being part of the tribe of coaches or uh, leading an empowered wife workshop. Because desire is the seat of feminine power. And when you invite your desire to come in and sit down and start making arrangements in your mind for it to be so, the universe rearranges itself too. 
I had an arm's length desire for a pool for over a decade. And really, there was nothing stopping me but me. When I was finally willing to sit with my discomfort about how impractical it is and be willing to nurture that desire instead of trying to squish it down, guess what? There is now a big hole in my backyard where a pool is going to go. That's what I see with the coaches too. They arrive with stories of how they created the time, the investment, and the space to train in ways they didn't imagine just by honoring their desire. Step number three, come to my free masterclass on purpose, prosperity, and intimacy, how to have all three and help others do the same. One of the reasons I'm so happy you and I found each other is because 20 years ago, when I first started to focus on fixing my marriage with the six intimacy skills, it was meeting with women like you who make their relationships a priority that finally made my new habits stick and gave me the imperfect but dreamy marriage that I have now. But here's a confession. When I'm not having those conversations on the regular, I notice my marriage suffers. My old unpleasant habits start to creep back in. Sharing what I've learned about how to have a lasting marriage with other wives and standing for their greatness and encouraging them as a relationship coach is a vital part of what keeps my marriage shiny. And it's not just me. My coaches say the same thing, that sharing with, encouraging, and standing for the greatness of other women took their marriages higher than they could have imagined. That's why I wish that every woman could be a relationship coach and an expert on the six intimacy skills and enjoy the benefits to her life and to her marriage and and to her family that come along with that. And that's why I created a free masterclass called Purpose, Prosperity, and Intimacy, How to Have All Three and Help Others Do the Same. If the idea of being a relationship coach calls to you, I invite you to register for this masterclass. You can do that at lauradoyle.org slash purpose. Come to the masterclass, see if it speaks to you, and then I'll tell you the next steps if it does. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest Anne's husband said he wanted a divorce, and he meant it, because five months later, they were legally, officially divorced. The main reason being, their marriage was failing, but also because he started a relationship with another woman once he said he wanted the divorce. But Anne didn't give up on her marriage, and they ended up reconciling in the same month that their divorce was finalized. And they remarried three months to the day later. They even started a family. And now she says their relationship is amazing, fun, and loving. She's going to describe what she did so you can have the same results. And welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. I'm so excited to get to hear your story. Thank you so much. I am honored to be speaking with you and here to just share my story. Well, t- let's go back to the beginning. What were things like in the bad old days of your marriage? So the bad old days are kind of interesting because in the moment, I didn't realize they were that bad. Um, every now and again, every maybe year, every other year, I would uh, accusatorily ask my husband if he was cheating on me. Um, I never had any proof of any kind, just a feeling, uh, a, I guess a gut feeling But I guess now looking back, I just felt distance between us. And so I just automatically went to that. And so, you know, hindsight, that was a spouse fulfilling prophecy in its own, in its own way. I was setting up that expectation and it wasn't until everything came crumbling down 
that I realized all of the things, but there were some little red flags along the way, but of course my part of it. But in the bad old days, actually living it day to day, we were friends with each other. We got along well. We renovated an entire house together and our contractor um, was like, you guys do this really well. You should kind of do this. But um, so we, we did a lot of things, traveled, but I, so I never expected it to keep going and getting worse. I just thought this was our marriage. But the questioning him every year, every other year or so, uh, that would always stick in my mind. And I just guess I thought that other marriages were the same way, that that's what other wives did. And I think that's because it's kind of portrayed on TV in, in our culture. And it's kind of a joke. It's funny to kind of hint that at your spouse. And really, it's not. That's not. That's allowing fear to come in and, and um, insecurity when your faith should be there. Your faith should be stronger than your fear. But like I said, now that I've learned so much, in hindsight, I realized that not only we, but I, mostly I, uh, I lacked in a lot of areas. I lacked in respect, vulnerability, gratitude, tenderness, humility. I, I didn't know. I knew those words. I didn't know what they truly meant until reading your books because I've read The Empowered Wife, The Surrendered Wife, and I'm jumping again here a little bit, but I also read The Surrendered Single even because that's where I was headed. So yeah. I've read them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, I didn't receive graciously. I remember one time he got me a really pretty ring for Valentine's Day that I, I'm 99% sure I told him what I wanted. And, um, <laughs> maybe a hundred percent sure I told him what I wanted and it wasn't the ring I wanted. And I, I was so angry. I raged at him. And, and now I look back and I'm just mortified at that encounter. I've apologized for that since we've been back together. Um, I mean, it, it's just embarrassing to think about that, but I, I didn't receive graciously. I didn't realize I had any power at all. I would hear about, oh, women have the power in the re- relationship. And I didn't understand what that meant. I, I got what I wanted, but I wasn't full of gratitude. So it fell flat on me. I just wanted more I felt like I was deserving of it. It was my job to keep him humble, to not get a big head about his work or about anything. Uh, It was my job to keep him grounded. I was so controlling how he drove. Oh, I mean, that was that. It must have been awful to drive with me. Um, I was always the better driver. How he dressed, what he should do with his car when he should take it into the shop. Uh, what he should say if he was like trying to, if he was what I assumed, he was trying to get laughs from friends. I would just kind of be like, okay, okay, gosh, that's, I mean, that is controlling and ugly. And I wouldn't want to be with a person like that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny though. I think, I think this is not that uncommon, right? That we're, for some reason, we think that it's our job as wives to, I don't know, keep them in check or mm-hmm. like you said, to keep them humble, right? You didn't want them to get to, to become arrogant, get too big of a head. So you're going to be his reality check. That's so. right. And, and I think I also thought that he was a direct reflection of me and I don't want to come across as yeah. arrogant and, and um, not humble, not thankful, even though I obviously wasn't very thankful. Um, so yeah. It was, I mean, looking back, that's a, that's suffocating. And I get that now. I wish I had gotten that before. The other thing is that I never talked to any other women about our marriage ever. I thought that Mm. that actually was being respectful, not talking about my relationship with my husband. To me, that was respect, not not the fact that I criticized and critiqued. That was just me being a wife. <laughs> <laughs> but keeping it all, yeah, just keeping it all to yourself. Uh, yeah. I'm not sharing, yeah. And, and, and why, would, why did you consider that to be respectful, would you say? 
Um, I think maybe just in my upbringing and things I have heard and throughout my upbringing is just kind of keep things in the marriage in the marriage and and don't talk about that like this I guess that's private and you, you want to okay that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and so and, and and your marriage didn't feel uh like it was distressed really it sounds like so it really wasn't it wasn't like you're going to go to your girlfriend and say oh he did this or he did that did right you, did actually you? to to my girlfriends I would speak very very highly of him I never I wasn't that wife that um cuz I was actually turned off by those wives that would just be like oh he's just awful you know just complaining and going on I didn't do that and at the same time I never complimented or praised or thanked or um just just have gratitude for my husband so he never heard that he never saw that he only got the keeping it like push, pushing him down, keeping him humble, keeping him in check. So well, how did you know? How did you first realize, okay, my marriage is really in trouble? We actually went on a, a week long trip with some really good friends, just another set of friends. They were married. And over the course of that trip, I just saw my friend's husband treat her in an overall tender way. He would just wait for her while they were walking, hold open the door for her and for me. He would, like as she walked in through the door, just lightly put his hand on her back. It was, I guess, mostly the physical uh, things I picked up on. And my husband wasn't doing that. He was more concerned with, walking up with his buddy or in my mind, you know, being funny, getting some laughs, making comments. And he just wasn't attentive in any regard to me. And I just was like this, I didn't have the words for it. I don't even know if I still do have the words for it. It was just in the moment, that feeling. And I just was like, this isn't, their marriage isn't like ours. And it, hit me in the face. And we had hung out with them. I can't tell you how many times before, but because it was like a five or six day trip, morning to night, I saw it every day. And so nothing happened when we got home from that trip. Oh, on that trip also, it was a wonderful trip. We had a great time, but there was no romantic anything in the bedroom. And to me, that was also a little bit like, huh, Like there was no hinting at it. There was nothing. And so after that trip, we got home and we were actually on our way um, out of town again the next weekend. It was a a busy time of year. And I'm not sure how it came up, but at some point along the way, we pulled off the highway and I just looked him in the eye and I said, after this weekend, I don't want you to come home. And after I said it, I... I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was hoping he was going to say, what? And like, come back at me with no chance. That's not happening. Fighting, like fighting mode. And it wasn't fighting mode, but he was kind of like, what is this? This is out of nowhere. What is happening here? Um, If you really want me to, okay. But like, what's the deal? So it wasn't what I had anticipated, what I had hoped for. We ended up, you know, getting through that conversation, fixing it, whatever that even meant at the time. But we went and had a wonderful weekend and we never talked about that conversation again. Wow. It never came up. And so that summer, I still was feeling it. I was I was still feeling it. So I kind of went on a little spiritual journey that summer. And I was listening to my Christian music and really just pouring into that part of my life. Um, He didn't necessarily know that. Um, Nobody really knew that. I guess my sisters did. But, um, and I thought that that was what needed to happen. That's all that needed to happen. I started to also tap into being a little bit more... um, available in the in in the bedroom 
I got some lingerie and I, you know, just was like, this is what a guy wants. This is what my husband wants. And so we're fine. I, in my head, we were fine. We were just going about it. And next thing I know is when everything fell apart. And that was about eight months after that trip. And he woke up one morning and I could tell he had been crying and he tried, he tried to deny it, but he, um, I, I said, what is wrong? What's going on? He said, we need to talk. And he'd never said that to me ever. So I was like, okay, this is serious. And he said, I know why you've always asked why I've been cheating on you. And it's because I've realized that I don't love you like a husband should love a wife. And I don't think I ever have. <gasps> yep. oh, and um, he said that he wanted a divorce and he meant it. He, I knew, I knew in that moment, he 120% meant it. Something had changed about his whole demeanor, even from the night before. And I, I took it very seriously. I just started crying and I don't think I stopped crying for about three days. I lost so much weight in the first week I stopped eating. My body reacted to it. And um, I actually left town to go to my sister's. My other sister and her kids came up to be with me because in my family, my sisters are married. They have their kids. My parents are married. There isn't divorce in my exact family that I grew up with. My dad had previously been divorced before any of us were born, but that wasn't talked about because that wasn't a, that didn't involve any of us. And so this was a big deal for my family, for all of us. And my parents and my sisters, their kids, my brothers-in-law, they love my husband. So this was shocking. And uh, I, so I just left and I wanted to go to marriage counseling. We were on the phone talking. Uh, I was talking to my husband off and on. Um, I had also taken my, our dog. He was about 11. He had congestive heart failure. I ended up putting him to sleep during all of this. And so I, my family, my little family, my husband and my dog were gone. And Mm -hmm. it was just, it was, it was really a scary place to be. And I was around my family that first week. I mean, I just took off from work. I just was off from work. I didn't know what else to do. And I traveled to see my parents in the Northeast, traveled to see my other sister after she went home down in South Carolina, cut my hair, (laughs) try to make a change that way. my husband finally did say he would go to marriage counseling. So we did. We came back. I came back into town. We went to counseling and he said, well, let's schedule another appointment. And he scheduled another appointment within 45 or 48 hours. And so I was like, oh, okay. I'm hopeful here. Yeah. But after that appointment, the counselor said um, it would take a miracle for him oh. to come back around. Oh. And I was just defeated. He never admitted to any infidelity or anything, not to the counselor, not to anybody. And yeah, it was going to take a miracle. And so I just, I was like, oh my goodness, I don't even know. I don't even know what that means. I, I, I'm just me. I'm just me. <laughs> so yeah, that started the absolute hardest summer of my life. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's very painful to have somebody who seems like an authority, right? The marriage counselor is kind of the authority on your marriage saying, oh, this is hopeless, essentially, right? That was the message. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And that's also the message my husband was giving off too. I mean, yeah, he yeah. was done. He was done. Yeah, so, Although he was going to marriage counseling. And yeah, so he, right? he yeah. like reflecting back, it's interesting because he, he will even say, yeah, it's kind of interesting. He was like, because... I was obviously in a very, very dark place. He said, but I, we stayed in contact the whole time. He and I did texting, phone calls. Um, so there was always something down there. I always had this vision in my head that his heart was, his heart was black, but at the very, very, very bottom, it was still red. And so, because there would be things we would talk about, I'm like, oh, that red part is getting a little bit juicier. <laughs> It's getting redder. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then he would just 
he would be mean again, or I would be mean. I mean, I was no angel either. Oh, I was sure. mean right back. Hurt people and, hurt, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Hurt in that, yeah, yes. That and, um, and so he, over the course of the next, things moved fast because I got back into town. We did the counseling. He, we never stayed in the same house together. He stayed in a, a hotel and then he went ahead and got an apartment and moved out within a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks after that, he ser- served me divorce papers. Wow. It, it wow. moved fast. Yeah. And then after that, we went to court because I had gotten my own lawyer and she advised me on some things to do. And, you know, his lawyer didn't agree. So we went to court, we put our house on the market. And then finally, after that, he came clean and he admitted to the affair. And it was something I, I knew was going on in the background. I, I knew. I tried to believe him. I tried to trust him that it was nothing, that he was just done. But that's also not his personality. And he also doesn't just go angry and get nasty for no reason. Right. Um, even after all those years. So uh, when he admitted it, I was kind of like, I, I knew, but I also handled it terribly. I hadn't read your books yet. And I do very vividly remember towards the end, he was like, well, what do you want? And I said to him, what do you want? <laughs> I wanted him again to like come back with a, a fierceness of like, I want this to work. Sure. And uh, of course, yeah. yeah. And now knowing what I know, he was wanting to know my desire and I really wanted him back. I had already decided. I remember telling my sister, even if he is with somebody else, I want him back. So I had made that my, my mind up before knowing he was with anybody. Wow. And, um, and so because of my reaction, that turned him away again. And it was, it got kind of nasty and mean again, um, after that. And we went through mediation. Oh my goodness. The whole day of that. And it was just awful. And I caught glimpses of him as like, I walked to the bathroom or he went to get something to eat and he just looked devastated. And he's admitted after the fact that is that day of mediation is the worst day of his life. But that was just really hard for him. For me, it was kind of like, I mean, it was t- still incredibly painful and hard, but I was like, well, this is final. And I so just... at this point, you have given up. You really think your marriage is over. I mean, in a way, in a way, I was like, because legally, who comes back from this? I hadn't heard of anybody. I hadn't heard of anybody coming back from that, really. Um, and... It, I mean, yeah, it was a long shot. So there was a part of me that was like, no. Actually, after the day of mediation, he called me. And uh, I started like shaking. I was very nervous because I was like, what does he want? And he, um, we were in the parking deck. I accidentally got off on the wrong level. So flustered. So he found me, picked me up, took me to my car. We ended up talking for a while. And he was crying and very upset and distraught. But again, we left that evening and I, I didn't know what was happening. Like, I didn't know we weren't back together. We, he didn't say anything about getting back together. And so it was just an incredibly confusing time as well. It was painful, it was hard and confusing because yeah. I didn't know. I, he, one day he, like he, he called me to me, reaching out, wanting to get in touch with me, but then we go our separate ways. And so... It was really interesting, to say the least. Not long after the, that day of mediation, though, I my sister came across your um, something on Facebook, a seminar on Facebook, and then she read your book and she passed it along to me, and I just devoured that. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was so eye opening. I was in a state of just, I think just total openness and brokenness. So I was, I accepted critiques from family and friends and I like to, to make me better. I knew it was only to make me better. 
So when I was reading your book, I soaked it up and I was like, yeah, I have been incredibly disrespectful to my husband. I, I, I can't even count the times I've been disrespectful. And so one of the first things I do remember um, saying to him is I had, I apologized. I said, I apologize for being disrespectful. And he looked at me and he said, you haven't been. So it's interesting because that just goes to show how far away we were from knowing what respect was, both of us. He didn't even realize that it was disrespect. And I didn't know that I had been disrespectful. So it was just the culture, I guess, that we didn't even know what that meant. It's hard. It's really hard to believe now. (laughs) Yeah. Because not like it doesn't fly anymore. It doesn't fly. (laughs) Or with him. He now knows (laughs) that he's being disrespected. And he'll sometimes tell me. So, but he never, he never indicated that before. Was that hard to say? Was it hard to get those words to come out of your mouth the first time? Um, not as hard as you might think. Okay. I think because I had ba- come back around to being hopeful again yeah. after especially he called me on that day of mediation. So there was some hope still growing. And so um, I don't remember the timeline exactly, but it was probably a couple of weeks after that when I said that. And it just, it was awkward because I'd never talked like that, but um, I knew it's what I needed to say. Yeah. regardless of if we got back together or not, I knew I needed to apologize for that. And I, mean, I think that's big because you were willing to be awkward because that's not what you yeah. want to say, right? It's kind yeah. of a deal. Yeah. 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 I that's love it. Just, and then, yeah. Yeah. So what happened next? So um, I, I remember a couple other things at the same time definitely started with that, uh, that saying that. And then I would use some duct tape. I said, whatever you think. I remember one time specifically with our house, there's a whole thing happening with our house and selling it. And the real estate agent wanted to paint the, the interior chimney fireplace. And I happened to walk in one day and I was like, oh my gosh, it was like a buttercream yellow. I was like, this does not look good. And so I texted my husband and I said, I can't. And, um, he goes, okay, I'll take care of it. And he, he did, he jumped on that. He took care of it and I could see small things happening. There wasn't anything huge. He was still pursuing this divorce and, um, but I could see small things happening and I was, it gave me hope. But then like the next conversation or two, it would be like, uh, drained because something would come up and it would be a little bit mean between us. But I could see some little fires starting to grow. So I was getting more and more hopeful. Um, But that summer also, my faith was incredibly reignited as well. And so my prayer life was, I mean, I was just praying all the time. and, And my husband had later told me, that he remembered reaching rock bottom one of the nights. And he just, he said, he reached out to God and said, what do I do? And he said, it was his clearest day that he needed to come back to be with me. So I was like, that's an answered prayer. Yeah. (laughs) I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it when he told me that. So it was really, looking back, it was the most needed summer of my life because you've always said in your books too that, no matter what, I'm going to become a better version of myself. And so I knew coming out of that summer, that's what was going to happen to me, whether or not we were together. Um, I had hoped we were going to be together, but I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And so, so yeah, we, the, the paperwork went through um, on our, what would have been our 10 year anniversary. So we had a full 10 years together and including dating and, our engagement, we were together for 12 years and, um, my family had been done. They didn't have hope anymore because they were like, okay, it's finalized. It's done. It's over. And I wanted to go down that route, but there was still something pulling me. I think if I'm being honest, it was God just saying, hang on, I have a plan here. Just hang on, keep doing what you're learning to do. 
with the skills and just trust. And um, sure enough, within like three or four weeks, however many (laughs) weeks there are in August, we were on the phone and I just flat out asked him if the other person was, and I said the name and there was a pause. And then he said, yes. And from that point on, we were on the phone for like hours. The floodgates opened and we got together for dinner that night. And he said, we're not going to be apart after this. And I just was like, because when I said her name, I don't know her. I've never met her. I just had a feeling it was this person, a coworker. And it was a new coworker, actually. When the relationship started, she was brand new. And so I just had a feeling. And uh, when I said her name, I didn't... I was very calm. Because I had worked through so much stuff. I'd been working and reading through the skills too for about maybe two months at that point. So I was like, okay, I can handle this. The worst is over um, as far as, you know, bombs being dropped. And so, yeah, I, I think it was in big part because of my reaction to when he admitted who it was that we were able to reconcile like that evening. So there was emotional safety for him. Because That's right. You could have gone down a road of like, how could you or... Why we, you know, why would you do this to me? It sounds like you didn't do that. You just listened. Yep. Wow. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, in the coming months, I would do that. Sure. Because you're a mere mortal woman, right? I'm a mere mortal woman, right? But in yeah. that moment, I reacted exactly like that. I just gave him the space to 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 speak, and he felt that emotional safety to to do so. Wow. That must have made your heart fly when you said we're never gonna be apart now. Oh yeah. <laughs> it must have melted. <laughs> I mean <laughs> I just like sent out a text to my family. I called we were on this huge like five phone conference, phone conversation, and I was just like, Yeah, we're we are back together and we are moving forward and Everybody was just very happy. Because like I said, nobody in my family wanted this either. No. Nobody did. I mean, my nieces no. and my nephew, oh, they were crushed too. And they yes. were younger, yes. but they all knew and loved him. And oh man, it was it was devastating for my whole family. And maybe a month after we got back together, we flew up for my cousin's wedding. And that's when he was reunited with my family and none of the kids were there. None of the brothers-in-law were there, just like my sisters, my parents. And we sat around talking for hours before my cousin's wedding. And he answered everybody's questions. I mean, he felt safe to share. And it was really like, I'll never forget that moment. It was really wonderful. And I just sat there and I soaked it in. And I just remember this is his, this is his story. So I I can't say anything to it, to add to it, to correct him or anything. And so it was really, it was wonderful. And that's a big shift from what you described was going on earlier, right? Where you, you were keeping him in, you know, humble, right? So you were doing that during this conversation. No, just let him be himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did start marriage counseling with the same guy that we had seen the, that said it was going to be a miracle. miracle guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We and um, went back and said, I have a miracle here. <laughs> that's right. I had continued to see him individually um, through that summer and he was very helpful and nice. And so when we got back together, I said, I would like to try, I would like to go and see him and talk to him. And my husband actually uh, really ended up really liking him and respecting him. And he, I, I totally understand the angle about, um, counselors and marriage counselors, because I went to a different person and I was not impressed. I 
sat there and I was just like, you're just telling me what I just said, but in a different way. And she had me write out a pros and cons list. And I was like, the cons list is going to far outweigh the pros list because of where I'm at right now. So not all counselors are created equal by any stretch. No, definitely but not. our count no. And <laughs> our counselor though is pro marriage. And so he he said it was going to be a miracle. Um, not in a I mean, just being honest, but he also is a Christian man and he believes in miracles. And so he was just saying this, it would take something big to turn him, to turn my husband's ship around. And, and so, yeah, when we showed back up, he was like, it was a miracle. And yeah. uh, he actually, yeah, <laughs> he's actually the one who remarried us. Aww. And um, yeah. It was just a simple ceremony, him, us, and then we had uh, the receptionist be a witness. And it was Aww. very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> that is very sweet. So so the moment you knew, okay, this is, we're going to make it. We're going to get back. I mean, when what was that moment where you thought, okay, I get my marriage back? Um, the, the night we reconciled, I trusted his words. I trusted him. In the past, I would have been weary of that. And not to say that I was a hundred percent, like never questioned it. I had questioned it over the course of the next, you know, months or years. But I just went just as serious as he was when he said he wanted a divorce. He was just as serious when he said, I'm all in. He wasn't trying to play games and drag my heart through the mud again. He knew that that was devastating for me. And so, I mean, cause even, even while we were separated, he would say, I just hate how I have hurt you so much. Just different mm-hmm. times. He would come out with some really sweet things that he would say. And so I, I knew he meant it. And then again, with his wedding vows, we wrote our own vows. When we originally got married, we didn't. And we we did this time. And just hearing his vows, I was just bawling. Because <laughs> they were just perfect. They were just amazing. Um, they were perfect for me. For me as his wife, they were exactly what I needed to hear. And and that's actually what our the uh, marriage counselor said to He goes, you know what, what I find interesting is both of your vows were exactly what each other needed to hear. He's like, so you, yeah, this is, this is going to be good. <laughs> this is good. It's a good sign. So what's your relationship like now? What's your marriage like? Oh man, it is. It's kind of weird to think about the bad old days because they actually kind of seem like a different lifetime in, in a way because things are just so much more peaceful. There's not an underlying anxiousness. I am on my own paper. He has a pile of laundry on his side of the room that I don't have to touch and I don't. And it's so freeing. I feel so loved and cared for and protected. And he is Ste- he has stepped up to the husband plate in a way I never could have imagined. I, I never could have imagined it. And now that we're parents too, I have totally, I, I know prior to, I call it, my sister and I call it doiling. Those are what the <laughs> skills are to us. We call it doiling. And um, prior to doiling, if I were a parent, I know it would I would be controlling. I would know what's best. I would know what to do. I would know what to say, where to go, what to feed. And I just, yeah, when I'm home, I do that. That's what I that's what I do when I'm home with her. But when he's home, I mean, he is free to be her daddy and she knows it and he knows it. And it's just amazing. And yeah, sometimes things scare me a little bit. Oh, maybe that was a little high, but I I don't tell him that because he he wants to pre- just as like, uh, in the air kind of yeah. A little high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 
just as I want to protect her, he wants to protect her even more. And he wants to protect me. And he'll say it. And it's also in his actions. And it's really just a a wonderful place to be. I never would have thought that reconciling was going to be this amazing. That the hard, hard work put in the months, the I mean, even a, a couple years after we got remarried would lead to this. I'm just, I'm just in awe. And when you think about that trip you took with the couple where he was so tender for those six days, um, how does that compare to your marriage? Oh, I actually, <laughs> I actually think our marriage blows it out of the water now. <laughs> I'm just kind of like sitting here. I'm like, oh, if we were to go on vacation now, watch out. (laughs) It would just be amazing. He took me, um, he surprised me with a birthday trip just a few months ago. He planned everything. I had no idea. And he called his parents to come in from out of town to watch our baby. And I didn't know any of it, but he called me. He goes, I didn't want to have to do this. I'm running late at work. And I just wanted to let you know. He said, I had a whole thing planned that I was going to be home in time and tell you to pack a bag, we're leaving. He said, but I'm going to just give you the heads up now. But pack a bag, we're leaving. <laughs> and my parents are on the way. And I just wow. trusted him. It was just so wonderful because I trusted him. I didn't say, well, where are we going? I didn't, I didn't want to spoil it. I didn't want to spoil it for myself, for him. And it was wonderful. Awesome. That is amazing. Okay. So, and then you mentioned too, that respect doesn't fly anymore at your house, like, like it maybe used to. So what does that look like? Let's, Cause you're a mere mortal woman. So once in a while, mm-hmm. maybe you're disrespectful still. What, how does that look? So it's, it doesn't happen honestly that often. I really, I, I really do try to stay on my paper as much as possible and just, I have my own life going on. I have my own self-care going on, which back in the old days, self-care, I would. I'd go into the mall. I'd get my nails done. I didn't, I didn't know to acknowledge it as self-care. I thought it was something I deserved, that I, I was owed. And so now I'm just sitting there when I get a pedicure and I'm just like, oh, this is amazing. And I'm thankful for it. And I thank him for it. But so when there's disrespect, he is a lot more in tune to it. And he'll be like, well, that is disrespectful. And, and I'll just say, uh, I apologize for that. Um, and I do say ouch a good bit myself. So I'll just let him know if he's rubbed me the wrong way or just if, if I heard something, because that actually just happened. He said something, I interpreted it, or I actually thought he said something kind of on the mean side. So I said, ouch. And he goes, why is that an out? And I said, well, you said, I can't even remember what it was. You said this. And he goes, no, I didn't. I said this. So it <laughs> just helps out. to, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry for that out. And so, um, but he, he's very in tune to the ouch too. And he'll mm-hmm. just, he has used it. He'll use it now. He'll just say, ouch. That's out to me. <laughs> oh, this is this is the conversations you have at your house. He says that's these are the conversations. Or you say out, or he says out. So the whole yes. culture, it sounds like, has changed at your house. Yes, you're on your paper, being great yes. for your pedicure anyway. So, yes. <laughs> so what what's your tip for someone who says, "Hey, I want the kind of marriage where my husband is sounds like a wonderful father, and he." takes me on surprise trips and he's so tender. We're blowing other couples away, (laughs) (laughs) which is kind of fun. That's what we all want. So she wants to have that. How how should she, what should she do? What's your best tip for her? And she was maybe Um, where you were, where he's got an affair going, right? And she thinks, and they're getting divorced. They're getting divorced. And she wants to Yeah, I would, I, the first thing is if you feel a tension that something is off. You can't place your finger on it. Look in, clean up your side of the street, see what you can do. He's not going to fix it. He's not going to fix you. He's not going to make you happy. Only 
I can make myself happy. And I wish I had known that throughout all the years of that first marriage. It sounds like he puts a lot of time and attention toward that now. Yes, yes. I do so much less um, work, stressing, thinking <laughs> than I ever have. And I, ha- I get a start- essentially everything I want. And there's just gratitude. It's get- it gets tossed around like confetti here. <laughs> He's so thankful for me, for what I do with our baby. I'm just I mean, I'm just in awe at what he does providing for us. And that yin and yang is just like very, is very much in balance. Oh, it sounds very gratifying. It is. It is. What would you say to Anne from before? What do you know now that you want to tell her? Gosh, a lot. (laughs) Um, I think the biggest thing is gratitude is gratitude that re centers me because I have everything I could want or need right now. And it just makes me aware to what I have and what I have is amazing. Beautiful. Well, this is an incredible story. Uh, It's so encouraging and inspiring to hear that you can be divorced officially on paper uh, that your husband, you know, kind of marched through with it. He meant it and that you could still uh, create a beautiful family. Yeah. Or there was just going to be a broken one. Yeah. Before. And yeah. Uh, I just give you so much credit for, for doing that. And it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, you're very courageous. And thank you so much for sharing all the details with us. Uh, so we can end world divorce. There's somebody listening right now That's right. who says, That's right. okay, if Anne can do it, then, then I can do it too. That's right. And I think that putting in that hard work, that forgiveness, um, because he's not perfect. I'm not perfect. We have forgiveness and grace for each other that we didn't have before, but going through that reconciliation, just me becoming humble and being thankful and forgiving. And that is the, a big part to how our, our marriage is able to be healed. And I really believe that a lot of marriages could be healed if, if that is the, the um, posture taken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Well, yes, thank you so much. This has been um, really inspiring. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you and all of your work. I really, I wouldn't be where I am without it. Great to hear. Thank you. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fix a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. Yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice of the week. And the advice that I find most unbearable this week is from a popular motivational speaker who was talking about when to give up on someone. And he said almost exactly what I had said when I won the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award myself in episode one of this very podcast. So embarrassing. He said that if you're being abused, you have to leave. Any kind of abuse, physical, verbal, emotional, mental, get out, give up. Sounds like common sense, right? Who could argue with that? And it's absolutely true that safety comes first. And if you're not safe, then you have to get safe. No question about that. 
But what doesn't work about this relationship advice, and the reason I had to come out with an apology for writing it myself, is that I have since met so many courageous women in situations that they described as abusive, but they still saw their marriages as being at least 51% good. These women wanted support, not for getting out of those marriages, but for making them more peaceful, more serene, more secure and long lasting. And of course, they wanted to end the abuse for sure, but not through separation or divorce. They wanted healing within their families. And who can blame them? Despite this advice seeming pretty cut and dry, it's really not so simple to break apart a family, no matter what the reason. It's costly. It's heartbreaking. And it's hard on the kids. Heck, it's hard on the adults. These courageous women who decided not to leave, but instead to experiment with the six intimacy skills and the connection framework, wanted safety with the alleged abuser, not safety from him. They wanted it with him. And it turns out that's exactly what they got. I'm not talking about women just sucking it up and having dark secrets and ongoing pain to keep their family together. I'm talking about committed women using their influence wisely to create peaceful, safe homes, to clean up their side of the street, which in turn changed the culture in their homes for the better. You've heard their very stories on this podcast, but those breakthroughs came because they ignored the chorus of voices saying, you should leave, get out, you have to go. And that's why I had to admit that when I wrote pretty much the same thing as a new author about leaving, if you're abused, I was uninformed. I really had no idea what was best for wives in that situation. Only those wives know that. I was just afraid that if I didn't tell them to leave, people would yell at me. But telling anyone in an authoritative way that they should leave is just bossy and it's self-important and it requires no courage whatsoever. It's just something we've all heard lots of times, so we think it's common sense. It's common, all right, but does it make sense in every situation? My experience is that life is messy and relationships can be messy and one size very rarely fits all. For that reason, this advice that if you're being abused, you have to leave is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. I'm excited to tell you that next week, I'm going to let you listen in on one of Master Coach Kathy's coaching sessions with a real client. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I ordered throw pillows from Amazon and they haven't arrived yet, which is weird because I ordered them at least 15 minutes ago. 